In the first two lectures, we looked at translational symmetry, which gives periodicity to a crystal. And we learned that it's really the defining symmetry characteristic of a crystal. All crystals have translational symmetry. But for the vast majority of crystals, that's not the only symmetry that they have. They also have the kind of symmetry elements that we see in everyday objects or molecules, things like rotation axes and mirror planes. So in this lecture, we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at those symmetry operations. In the symmetry of crystals or molecules, we can basically boil all of the requisite symmetry elements down to just these five classes of symmetry. So we have, starting at the top, the identity symmetry element. And what does that do? Well, the identity symmetry element doesn't change the object at all. And really, it's there largely as a requirement of the mathematical properties of a group. So we're not going to worry very much about it, but it is always present. Then we have the inversion center. And the inversion center does what it implies. It inverts through a point. In a molecule, where we have a point that is unchanged by all of the symmetry operations, uh, that's where the inversion center would lie. And if we call that the origin, it would take an atom that has coordinates x, y, z in a Cartesian system and put that atom at coordinates minus x, minus y, minus z. We have the mirror plane, which is denoted by the symbol m. And the mirror plane, which should be very familiar to all of you, is just a reflection through a plane. And then we have two types of rotation axes. We have proper rotation axes and improper rotation axes, which are in the hermann mogwin system that's used for crystallography, roto-inversion axes. We'll talk about each of those in turn. So the proper rotation axis is also quite simple to visualize. If we have a proper rotation axis of order n, that means we're going to rotate about that axis by 360 degrees divided by n. And we're going to see some examples here in a minute. The improper rotation axis in the hermann mogwin symmetry of crystals is a little bit different than what you might have seen in the Schoenflies system used for molecules. So in the Schoenflies system, an improper rotation axis is a rotation by 360 degrees divided by n, followed by a reflection through a perpendicular mirror plane. But in the hermann mogwin system, the improper rotation axis is a roto-inversion axis. That is, we're going to rotate by 360 degrees divided by n, and then we're going to invert through a point and the axis is going to go through that inversion point. All right, so those are a little bit different, and that's important to keep in mind. Now, sometimes people describe these point symmetry operations or elements as entirely being rotational symmetry operations or elements. And the reason why is because these first three can all be defined as a kind of either proper rotation axis or roto-inversion axis. The identity would be the same as a one-fold proper rotation axis. Rotate by 360 degrees, divide by 1. Well, that's just going to be no change. The inversion center would be a one-bar roto-inversion axis. Rotate by 360 and then invert is the same thing as just doing an inversion. And the mirror plane, which is maybe the least obvious, we'll see in a minute, can be defined as a two-bar roto-inversion axis. Let's take just a graphical look at some of these symmetry operations, really the rotation and roto-inversion axes. So remember that in a crystal, we only have to deal with a finite number of rotation axes. Uh, and crystals can only have two-fold, three-fold, fourfold, or sixfold rotation axes. All other orders of rotation axes are not permitted in a crystal, as we discussed in lecture one. Here we see the twofold and the fourfold rotation axes. You can easily uh, imagine these. If you have a point x, y, z, and you rotate by 180 degrees about the z axis, it would take you to this point, minus x, minus y, z. 
right? And notice that we use the bar over the symbol to s signify a negative coordinate. If we had a point here and we rotate by a fourfold rotation axis, that's a rotation by 90 degrees, it would come here and then here and then here. And then after four successive operations of that fourfold axis, we'd be back to where we started. The threefold rotation axis and the sixfold rotation axis are shown here. Uh, the threefold axis is a rotation by 120 degrees about the rotation axis. And the sixfold axis is a rotation by 360 divided by 6 or 60 degrees. So these should be pretty easy to visualize. Now let's take a look at the roto inversion axes. Here is the one bar roto inversion axis that is rotate by 360 and then invert and so you can see that's exactly the same thing as inverting through this point where the axis goes through this plane we've shown the two bar roto inversion axis that's going to be rotate by 180 and then invert and that's going to take the point down to here that would be the same thing as a mirror plane that's perpendicular to the two bar axis. The four bar roto inversion axis is shown here. All right, so we're going to rotate by 90 and then invert. That would take us to this point. If we then operate again with the four bar axis, we're going to rotate by 90 and then invert. That would create this point. The third operation would be rotate by 90 and invert. That would give us this point. And then the fourth time we operate, it would be rotate by 90 and invert, and we'd be back to the beginning. And if we keep doing that uh, rotation axis again and again and again, we're just going to keep generating these four points. So the four bar roto inversion axis is a unique symmetry element. It doesn't translate as any other kind of symmetry. Uh, let's finish out by looking at the three bar and six bar roto inversion axes. Let's do the three bar first. Okay, so if we were to start, I don't know, let's say we start at this point. You know, we're going to rotate by 120 and then invert. So that would create this point. Uh, if we operate again, we're going to rotate by 120 and invert. We create this point. And if we operate again, we're going to rotate by 120 and then invert. We create this point. We see that for the three bar axis, after three operations, we're still not back to where we started. We have to kind of go around the circle one more time. So if we continue to operate, we go here and we generate this point. And finally, we go here and we generate this point here. And, and then the sixth time we operate would take us to here and then invert back to here, and that's where we started. So just like the four-bar roto-inversion axis, the three-bar roto-inversion axis is a unique symmetry element. It can't be defined any other way. Interestingly, the six-bar roto-inversion axis, which is shown here, um, is the same thing as a three-fold rotation axis coupled with a perpendicular mirror plane. Right? Let's see that. Rotate by 60 and invert. That creates this point. Rotate by 60 and invert. That creates this point. And so on and so forth. So convince yourself that if with successive operations of the six bar axis, we would get uh, this picture. And so we'll see when we look at point groups, these equivalencies between, say, a six bar rotation axis and a threefold axis with a perpendicular mirror plane will be important.